Welcome to Our Jewish Roots with insightful Bible teaching by Dr. Jeffrey Seif. Thank you for joining us today. I am David Hart. I'm Kirsten Hart. I am Jeffrey Seif, and we are in some interesting stuff today, yes, as we look in Revelation. Right, we, you, so you have more messages to the churches, and then we have this vision of heaven. Yeah. Love reading that. The message of the church is kind of like a rap on the knuckles, you know, a little lukewarm, you know, and uh, that's not so good. But then we pivot to uh, a much happier scene. Good. We hope you have your Bible ready. Open it to chapter 3 of Revelation. Let's go there now. Nicole Carroll, editor-in-chief USA Today, wrote an article here, Facts Fight Fear, and we're here to help. Well, I think she's right. I think faith fights fear as well, and we're here to help. And uh, never mind what she wrote for the moment. I want to look and see what's in God's Word. But before we look at the Word, I want to back up and look at the world. By the way, get a hold of the Word, by the way. We're in Revelation chapter 3. It's where I'm picking up. But before we get here, let's go back here. And by back here, I mention the first century world. Uh, this is the Mediterranean. The Latins called it Mare Nostrum, Our Sea. Judea was one of their eastern provinces. There's Jerusalem. So much of the Bible, of course, takes place over here. But we're away from here right now. We're looking at letters that were written over here. The Revelation, we're looking about 95 AD. There's churches here, uh, congregations on the western edge of Asia Minor yesterday. Uh, Turkey today. Um, we're here, Ephesus, it's a major world cities, and there's a belt of a number of major cities just to the east of it, and that's where our story is today. Of course, the gospel expands outward beyond Judea. Paul went uh, through Cyprus and then into the heartland of Asia Minor on his first journey. Overland, he went through this on his second journey. Ephesus was a headquarters. He crossed the uh, Adriatic Sea, went into Philippi and Greece, and then pushed eventually all the way to Italy, but that's far away. We're here now, and there's a word of the Lord given to congregations here. In chapter 3, uh, there is a message given to the congregations in Sardis. Again, we're looking at a number of cities here, and they're exhorted. They're told, wake up and strengthen what remains. Uh, the whole idea of falling asleep is very common in, uh, uh, if you look in uh, the New Testament, there's this eschatological watchfulness. People fall asleep. Um, the disciples did as well. You might recall in Gethsemane, they were woken by Yeshua's arrest. Uh, things just kind of drag on and people get dreary, they get weary, and he says, wake up. And in verse 3, remember what you have received and heard. Uh, the exhortation to this watchfulness at the end of days to, to not let yourself slumber. Uh, there's a message given to another congregation here to the uh, east of Ephesus in Philadelphia. He says in verse 8, I know your deeds. He says in verse 9, there are these pretenders among you, these fakes. Uh, individuals who say they are Jewish but are not. By the way, parenthetically, there's, there's a lot of stuff that parades around in the name of, of Jewish perspective on biblical literature that's not particularly authentic, not very kosher. Uh, there are people here that are pretending to be part of the community, and the congregation, the early church is so Jewish, he just says, you know, they're pretending to be Jews like you. Uh, there's hardly any Jews in, in the church today, tragically. Uh, that's why I love this program, Our Jewish Roots. I really do. It helps stimulate an appreciation for things Jewish. He says to them in verse 10, he exhorts them that they've kept his word about patient endurance, subsequent to which he says, I am coming soon. 
Friends, hear me on this. We're going to get to interpreting fascinating passages in reasonably short order. But there's an exhortation here to uh, be patient and to endure. He speaks about a coming new Jerusalem uh, before we get out of verse 13. And I should mention that by the time of the writing here, uh, Jerusalem was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. He sees a new Jerusalem coming. That's a good news. And by the way, we live in a world today where we see Jerusalem arising, don't we? That's another story. To Laodicea now in verse 14, he says, you're lukewarm. Uh, would that you were uh, either cold or hot. He says, but I'm going to spew you out of my mouth in verse 16. By the way, interestingly, Laodicea was known for its lukewarm waters. And by the way, Laodicea in antiquity uh, was also known for the manufacture of eye ointment. I mention that because he says, I counsel you uh, to get salve to anoint your eyes in verse 18. It's kind of playing off where they are at the moment. When we look in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, therein, uh, the Lord is exhorting believers. The word to them is to endure patiently. You know, we can get stressed out in life and uh, to keep our faith up, uh, to not give in to temptation, to not give in to despair, disorientation, uh, decay. It can come upon us. Uh, we'll see, speaking of coming upon, this seasons of global upheaval, there's unrest. Uh, the revelation will go on to look at wars and rumors of wars and ravages in human experience. But the word here at the outset on the front end of it all is to, to carry on, to tarry on. God is with us, able to deliver us. Well, we're going to look at the world at the ragged edge of time as we consider the book of Revelation and we look at unveiling the mysteries therein. In chapter 5, the cat's going to get out of the bag in Revelation, and it's going to take a while to get him back in. We'll get at the end of the book for that, but we're in chapter 4 now, and it's this in-between moment. I mention that because in chapters 2 and 3, uh, there's messages to believers, moral exhortations to keep the faith, etc. In chapter 4, there's this wonderful experience where uh, the author is beckoned to go up. In chapter 4, verse 1, that a door was standing open in heaven, and there's a voice, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Things are going to be described uh, in short order. But he's beckoned to come up and, in effect, experience something of a worship service on steroids. I, I mention that because we're told in verse 2, Immediately uh, I was in the Ruach, in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was standing in heaven, and one seated on the throne. And then around the throne there are individuals worshiping, etc. And the author here gets quite an experience. All that said, I want to hear at the outset of this segment, underscore the importance of experience. Uh, in religion, uh, that can be marginalized, unfortunately, in some circles. But, you know, I believe that people need to have something that's impactful, something that's painted on their imagination. And I mention that because here, uh, there's a bad moon rising. But on the front end of that, there's a vision of God which gives a kind of encouragement and a strengthening to bear up with the troubles of the day. And, oh goodness, we are going to be seeing troubles of the day in short order. But first, there is this experience likened to Isaiah in chapter 6, where the Lord beckons him up and he has a vision. You know, I saw the Lord. And... Uh, you know, holy, 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 kadosh, 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 Adonai Tzivaot, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. There's only one vision in Isaiah the prophet. He was a writing prophet. Uh, these visions are all over here, but we're told here that there's uh, various visions, verses 6 and 7. Uh, there are these creatures that emerge, a lion, an ox, a face like a man, an eagle. And when we get in the book of uh, Ezekiel 
And in the books of Daniel as well, we see this same kind of imagery, fascinating, shocking, scary. There are these living creatures in verse 8, and they can't. Kadosh, 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 Adonai Tzivaot. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, who was and is and who is to come. We're told in verse 9, uh, that these living creatures would give glory and honor and thanks to the one seated on the throne. We see this in Ezekiel as well. There's the, the, the Markabah, the chariot. There's this picture of God in the heavens swirling around. Uh, people think flying saucers on occasion. Fascinating imagery. Uh, and here this image is resurrected in Revelation, a, a powerful image of God who's seated on the throne. And individuals in verse 10 are worshiping him. And I should say, by the way, that uh, we do that now. Those who've had an experience with the Lord, even amidst the turbulence of trying times, we turn and we put our eyes on him. It says it explicitly in the literature that they uh, worship him who lives forever. It's an executive decision, and I hope that you are minded to do that as well. And they can't, in verse 11 here, Worthy are you, O Lord, our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things. Because of your will, they existed and were created. So in this segment, there's this powerful, worshipful image that the eyes are turned toward the Lord. He's on the throne. It's not going to look like it in short order because the world's going to come unglued. Uh, I want to get to chapter 6 and that which follows in short order. We're going to see apocalyptic vision. We're going to see plague and turmoil unleashed on the earth. But we'll get to that in the next segment. Here again, let me underscore the importance of having a relationship with the Lord, walking with the Lord, having a worship experience with the Lord. Turn your eyes upon him. And he's got answers. And he has help that will meet us and greet us. Help as we need it, as we find ourselves amidst turbulent times. And those times get rocky. We're going to look at that as we go in Revelation, the unveiling of the mysteries. Our Creator chose certain places on the planet to reveal Himself and His message of redemption to us. Mount Sinai, Moriah, Olives, the Mount of Beatitudes, as well as various seas, rivers, and deserts, these were the places. Some are now only ruins, yet they continue to tell of the Lord's faithfulness and love. These sacred backdrops have been beautifully captured in our resource this week the book, Heaven and Earth, Landmarks of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Our producer and director, Ken Berg, has assembled some of his favorite photographs taken during his four decades of travel through the lands of the Bible. Contact us and ask for the book, Heaven and Earth. If you only watch us on television, you're missing additional content available only on our social media sites, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. You can always visit our website, which is home base for all of our ministry activities and information. There you can sign up for our free monthly newsletter, watch the TV program, or visit the online store. You can sign up for a tour of Israel and Petra, or a cruise to Greece and Ephesus. Please contact us for more information. If you're not connected with us on social media, we like to say that you're missing out on a lot what this program offers. You can find us on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook with lots of information. We have some exciting news. This whole series is about Revelation and we get to go to Greece right. and to the Isle of Patmos where John had the revelation. That is something that this ministry has offered for years. Every fall we go to Israel, but we also take this extension. We go in the fall and the spring, two tours a year. 
levitt.com information and it's easy to sign up for our tours. And it's also life changing. We would love for you to join us. Right now, let's go back to Dr. Seif's teaching on Revelation 5. Uh, we're still in heaven. That's the good news. Hell's going to break loose, but we'll do that next week in the next program. In the fifth chapter, um, which falls on the heels of the fourth and goes before the sixth, as you might well imagine. Uh, here we are, we're in heaven, and this author sees in verse one a scroll. And the question is, who can open this? Who can give voice to it? Who can explain it? And we're told in verse five, one of the elders says, stop weeping. We have someone that can open this up. Behold the, and this is biblical Jewish language, behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root of David has triumphed. He is worthy to open the scroll. Jesus is described in Jewish terms. That is uh, associated with the tribe of Judah, the lion, the strong rulership, scepter, going back to Genesis. He is the root of David. He's descended from David. You have that in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus, uh, the Messiah, son of David, son of Abraham, and you look at the genealogical record. Jesus here is associated with Jewish stock. This is the answer for the world's problems. Now, we're going to see in a moment how the world rages against all that. And in conjunction with alighting upon that, if you'll permit me to extol the virtues of a program like this, uh, we don't just proclaim Jewish, uh, Jesus, excuse me, we don't just proclaim Jesus, but we proclaim Jesus with Jewish eyes, uh, judging that to be important. And if you find value in that, please share some value to help us tell that story. Uh, here, Yeshua is noted as the answer to the, uh, the quandary noted in the literature. And I like the Jewish background. He, as well as you read on, he is there noted as a lamb standing as having been slain. Now, a lamb that's slain for the world, by the way, is a very strong Jewish image. It harks to the temple proper, where animals were sacrificed, and to the Passover as well. The answer uh, is the, the, the lamb was slain. And by virtue of the lamb being slain in Exodus, they were extricated from misery, from slavery. I mentioned that if you look at the similarities in Revelation, and we're going to do it, we're going to get into turbulent waters in a moment. There are these plagues that are unleashed upon the earth, uh, and these are preludes to the great deliverance. It's like that in the Exodus too. Recall there were plagues that were unleashed upon the Egyptians. And then finally the lamb came that was slain, and, uh, and this was a judge to be salvific. It's the same imagery here that would have not have been lost to those Jewish readers of the story. And people are gathered around worshiping this lamb uh, in verse nine, singing a new song. You were worthy to take the scroll. You were slain by your blood. You redeemed for God those from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. See, this is the Passover story on steroids. The lamb and the Passover redeem the Jews. Here, this land redeems people from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. It's a fascinating story, and I hope that you count yourself among the redeemed. He says in verse 11, I looked and heard many angels around the throne and elders, and they were chanting in verse 12, Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Now, there are many people that think it's a waste of time to worship the Lord. And it certainly is a waste of resource to invest in the things of the Lord. But there are people who are energized, even in a difficult world, by a heavenly vision, by virtue of their being the people of God. And they say, worthy is the Lamb to receive power and riches. That is to say that he's worthy of it. And so it is we invest in expanding the kingdom with financial wherewithal. 
Having said that, let me encourage you, please, to help us to tell our story as we look at the good news through the eyes of the Jews. Oh, the good news is good, but the bad news is going to get bad by the time we get to chapter 6. And we are right there in short order next week where there's going to be turbulence in a big way. And we're going to explore the turbulence, the rocky road of human experience at the ragged edge of human experience. Oh, please help us tell this story. If you find value, if you find in the Lord that he's worthy of riches and honor and glory, sow some seed, please, and help us to make him known in this world as we consider the revelation and we look to unveil the visions noted therein. enjoyed hearing that song from our founder Zola Levitt and speaking of enjoying Jeff I'm enjoying the fact that you are carrying on the tradition that Zola started years ago of bringing the gospel and the Bible through Jewish eyes you're well, teaching thank you. what it really was like I think he was more visual in it you know Zola uh, would teach from Israel on location wearing robes and he looked like from the first century you know I don't go that way I don't want to be a cheap imitation of someone I'm not I'm more the eccentric professor kind of guy but both of us are all about Jewish studies as it relates to the Jesus story and I we all think it's important to look at the literature uh, with that in mind you were teaching today on on heavenly worship, on steroids, I think you said. <laughs> I like I, that term. I mean, what a picture of what that's going to be like someday. Yeah, it's ramped up. There's a juxtaposition. You know, earlier in Revelation, uh, congregants, believers are sluggish, they're lukewarm. And then we pivot to this uh, moment where people are, are excited. And with, I, I'd say the word funky, cool-looking creatures. I mean, something we've never, these creatures we don't have on Earth. 
I well, love that, you know, it, it's, the it, imagery of what it will be like. And again, that's one of the reasons why it's important to look at it with a Jewish lens, because we're bringing in uh, pictures uh, from Ezekiel uh, that employ a fantastic imagery. Similarly, Daniel, uh, it, it, fantastic imagery with animals. But here, uh, the throne of God in Ezekiel at the very beginning is characterized with these creatures with wings and so forth, different faces and the like. And uh, that seems to be at play here. Looks to me that Revelation is bringing in these mm, Older like Testament that. stories and pointing to the culmination of human history and the advent of the Messianic era. And there were... It's they were um, confined, so many were confined, and now we have visions of what it will be like after we're let go and we're in heaven, right? I mean, yes. gosh, what they've been walking through, and now it's like, here's a glimpse. Right, glimpse. and when you think, and it's an excellent point, because it relates to us today, not just back then, that, uh, that these people were suppressed. They were pressed under, alone, alienated in a bad way. Uh, a lot of people today find themselves pressed amidst the turbulence of trying times, plague, disorientation, despair, unemployment. It's not exactly the same, but but it's, uh, it's when you, you're looking forward to life over the horizon, is there hope? And, and we're looking at a message here that they would have understood that there's hope at the end of the day. I hope you understand there's hope as well. We live in a world today where hope can be in very high demand and very short supply. You can't read 10 minutes into the Bible without stumbling into it. And your favorite verse is? I was just thinking about yeah. that. Galatians <laughs> 6, 9, let us never get tired of doing what is right. For after a while, we'll reap a harvest of blessing if you don't get discouraged or give up. That's my life verse. And that patient endurance. Right. Endure through these times. Right. And if you don't lose heart, talk <laughs> about uh, losing well, heart. We don't want to lose the heart. Yeah. I appreciate so that. So <laughs> good news this week, next week. Well, maybe, you know, Revel so Revelation's a roller coaster. You down. say that as we talk behind the scenes and now as well. But, but we all know the end of the story. Uh, there's some turbulence in the literature, as there is in life, but we're on the winning end of all of it. Come back next week. Tell your friends to watch this whole series. Record it, and we will see Revelation through Jewish eyes. Thank you so much. Let's do it, and thanks for doing it. And as you go now, Sha'alu Shalom Yerushalayim. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Join us right now for additional content that is only available on our social media sites, Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Visit our website, levitt.com, for the current and past programs, the television schedule, tour information, and our free monthly newsletter, which is full of insightful articles and news commentary. View it online, or we can ship it directly to your mailbox every month. Also on our website is the online store, there, you can order this week's resource, or you can always give us a call at 1-800-WONDERS. Your donations to our Jewish roots help us to support these organizations as they bless Israel. Please remember we depend on tax-deductible donations from viewers like you. This has been a paid program brought to you by Zola Levitt Ministries.